Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest uh, in our series of webinars here at French Entree. Uh, we've opened the room up, um, so we're just seeing the uh, attendees come into the room. So we'll uh, we'll just give a, a few seconds for the majority of people to, to come through. Um, this morning we are uh, here on Zoom, um, but we are also streaming live on Facebook. So uh, whether you're watching. Uh, on the Zoom webinar that you registered for, or whether you're watching uh, on our Facebook page, welcome uh, to, to French Entree. Um, my name is Alistair Lockhart. I'm the uh, Property and Mortgages Director here at French Entree, uh, which is part of the uh, France Media Group. And in this session today, we're gonna to be talking about buying property and living in France, um, and in part through the lens of Brexit and COVID. Um, for those of you who don't know who we are, um, uh, how, how could you not? Um, French Entree uh, is part of the France Media Group. France Media Group is the world's leading specialist publisher uh, for everything to do with France, um, from travel and tourism to gastronomy, uh, to property and living in France. Um, and French Entree itself has a network of uh, bilingual partner agents over in France. Uh, and we've got um, a very long standing black book that we've built up over the last 15 years, full of experts, uh, full of all the ancillary services that you would need when you are looking to buy a property and live in France. So everything from um, mortgages, currency specialists, lawyers, accountants, tax specialists, wealth planners, uh, right down to the more granular um, removal companies, how do I get to France and, and even how do I install a swimming pool uh, in that massive plot of land I bought attached to my house. Um, so we're here as your resource. Um, if we don't immediately know the answer, uh, then we'll either know somebody who can or we will uh, be able to point you in the right direction. Um, so we, uh, France is, uh, remains a very stable a destination for international property buyers. Um, I personally have been involved with French property since 2004. It's traditionally a very stable conservative market uh, and, um, uh, and there's a lot of consumer protection for buyers which offers you real peace of mind when you're, when you're buying in France. That being said, you know, that's at a sort of traditional level, um, you know, looking at the last 12 or 18 months, it's been something of a roller coaster in terms of uh, not just for France, but for international travel and, and property generally. Um, and we have seen some some pretty unusual activity. Um, there are areas of France now where um, uh, demand has outstripped supply uh, and there's a shortage of, of good quality inventory in certain regions of France. Um, we've seen some extraordinary things that I've not seen um, in the last 15 years, which is French buyers moving out of cities because of Covid in bidding wars against British buyers who were desperate to get in before the Brexit deadline at the end of December. Um, quite quite unusual. Um, and also rural properties in France uh, selling for their asking price within days of going on the market when historically they might have easily been on the market for uh, a couple of months or, or even years. Um, in the cities, we've also seen a, a flattening uh, of demand and, and of prices. And again, that's that's got to be COVID related. Um, and we've also seen an evolution in the way people buy property. Um, and um, you know, some of our uh, experts will, will touch on this in terms of um, buying a property remotely, uh, using Zoom, WhatsApp, um, that's become increasingly common over the last 12 to 18 months. Obviously there are advantages and disadvantages to that, um, but it has been done and, and many of our partners have been doing that uh, quite successfully over the last uh, year or so. So we're going to be looking at the French property market through that lens of COVID and Brexit uh, in terms of what you need to consider in 2021 uh, and beyond. Um, we're expecting uh, an audience today of uh, hundreds from all around the world. Um, so I just wanted to try something, which is uh, if you're on Zoom or if you're on Facebook, um, perhaps you could open up the, the chat box on your Zoom uh, and just type in where you're watching this from. Where are you in the world? Um, that would be quite interesting to see. So um, let's have a quick look. So they're coming in fast and furious, Lake District, Somerset, USA, Hertfordshire, uh, Bournemouth, UAE, Israel, uh, Brighton, Utah, Wales, Switzerland, I can't read fast enough, uh, Detroit, um, France, uh, Durham, Richmond, uh, Whitstable, Australia, Manchester, from all over the world. So it's great. Thank you very much. So whether you are uh, here in the UK with a, a nice cup of coffee 
or whether you're somewhere in the world with a glass of wine, um, you're, you're very, very welcome uh, to this seminar this morning. Now, you might be here because you're subscribed to one of our amazing magazines uh, as a publisher. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't show these to you, French Entree uh, and France Today, which are available all around the world. Whether you're here because you subscribe to our newsletters or whether you're just here by chance, um, hopefully you're going to get some real value this morning from our panel of experts. Um, it's not designed to be a lecture series, um, even though I'm conscious I'm doing a lot of talking fast and furious. Um, our experts are going to deliver a short presentation uh, and then we are going to be uh, putting to them a couple of questions after each presentation. And then towards the end of the session, which is why it's definitely worth waiting until the end, we'll get to that really juicy Q&A bit. And, and this is your opportunity to ask questions of our experts. Um, so if you're on Zoom, there is a, a Q&A button. Um, which if you're familiar with Zoom, most of us are by now, uh, there's a Q&A button, put your question into that box. If you're on Facebook, please ask the question in the comments, one of my colleagues will pick that up. Um, and we're going to endeavour to get through as many of those questions as we can uh, throughout the session. Um, I'm going to be uh, ably assisted by my colleague Zoe Smith, who is the French Entree digital editor. Uh, Zoe is chomping at the bit to see all of the questions that come in because it's great intelligence for her in terms of the content that we should be writing about in the magazines and, and online. Um, and if we don't get to your question, it's nothing personal. Uh, if we run out of time or if the question is not quite right for the experts that we've got today, um, Zoe will be picking those questions up and wrapping those into content over the next couple of weeks. So uh, keep an eye on the website and the newsletters. So there should be um, a, a longer tail out of this webinar in terms of some useful content. Um, just a couple of housekeeping points before we get started. Uh, the session is being recorded, uh, which is the second, I think the second most asked question in 2020 after, are you on mute? Uh, it is the session being recorded um, and that will be sent out to everybody who has registered to attend as you would expect. Um, and if you want to get in touch with any of the panel, either myself from a, a property and a mortgages perspective or from our experts who I will introduce shortly, um, then you can use the email webinar at frenchontray.com. So webinar at frenchontray.com. That will come through to the team and we will point uh, your question in the right direction or come back to you with an answer. So without any further ado, let's meet our, our panel of experts. So uh, we're very lucky to be joined uh, this morning by three exceptionally busy people um, who've uh, agreed to come on and share their knowledge with you. So we've got Mar Bonin Palmer, from the Foreign Exchange Specialists and Money Corps. Uh, and Mar's gonna be talking about how to mitigate uh, against the risk of currency fluctuations, uh, which could potentially save you thousands, if not tens of thousands of euros, which is uh, obviously worth, worth listening to. Uh, we've got Daniel Harris from the law firm Stone King. Uh, Dan is an international cross-border specialist uh, with deep understanding of the French legal system, both from a property and a succession perspective. Uh, he's going to talk you through some of the uh, points to watch out for. Uh, and we've also got David Denton, uh, Head of International Technical Sales at Coulter International, uh, who are tax trusts and pension specialists. Um, and David's going to talk to us, amongst other things, about how best to structure your investments in a tax efficient way in France. So that's your panel. Uh, I'm going to hand over to the first speaker this morning, uh, who is Ma. Uh, Ma, the, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you so much, Alistair. And I'm going to attend, I suppose, to um, share uh, my screen right now with you. Um, let's bring it to the beginning, um, if possible. Yeah, that's good. We got it. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to the end. Um, so uh, thank you so much for your time today and thank you for inviting me, uh, French André. Um, my name is Ma and I work for a company called Monicorp. We are a foreign exchange specialist and what we do is we help private individuals uh, at changing their funds in an efficient way when they need to make a payment uh, uh, abroad. Most of you are buying to look at property or looking to buy a property in France. Um, most of you are having their funds or your funds in a different currency than euros. So at some point, uh, you will have to exchange your funds into euros to pay for your deposit and finally to complete on your property. And how you do that and at what rate you do that will determine entirely the purchase price that you are paying for that property. Therefore, uh, 
a change rate and for a change is quite a key element of the process. If I am now, you are in the UK and I tell you, uh, would you buy a property in the UK if I tell you that it's going to cost you £250,000 or maybe £262,000, you'll think it's crazy. But it is, this is often what happens with buyers overseas. They travel to France, uh, they find a property to buy, they put an offer without realizing that from the time that that offer is placed to the time where the property uh, uh, price has to be paid, the rates may move. And with that, the final price that you're paying for the property. This is what I'm going to cover today. Um, and we're going to see a little bit of what is the impact of this, of this volatility uh, that the change rates uh, uh, have on your transaction. I'm going to give you a couple of tips of uh, how to plan uh, uh, that payments to avoid jeopardizing that purchase price uh, with these movements of, of the rates. I'm going to do this by seeing two examples. Please do not be overwhelmed about this graph. I have put a lot of things in it, uh, but we're going to see two graphs, and I'm going to follow a little bit what the sterling against the euro uh, did last year, what it's doing now. I know that some of you uh, are not uh, based in the UK. Um, these examples hopefully are highlighting the impact of the rates um, and can be applied to other currencies. I would believe with the exception of US dollars. So I will say just because the US dollar last year was very strong, if you are holding US dollars and you have any specific questions, I'll be happy to discuss this uh, separately with you. Um, otherwise, we're going to take uh, the sterling against the euro as an example. And we're going to see the examples of two couples. Um, um, my first couple is called Mr. and Mrs. Short, and the second couple is called Mr. and Mrs. Lucky. Both of them have been looking for a long time to buy a property in France. Um, last year, as you can see here, the GBP euro was quite healthy at the beginning of the year at levels of 120, um, and suddenly uh, COVID started and as the pandemic and the lockdown has started, the pound plummeted. In fact, the pound was quite under a lot of pressure during the whole year, was one of the big losers of the currency markets um, and had an extra pressure at the end of the year with Brexit and with the threat of a known deal, which again put a lot of pressure uh, on the ground. My first couple, Mr. and Mrs. Shaw, don't know anything. They, they don't know any of this. They don't know what is going to happen, uh, but they know that they want to buy a property in France. So last year, at the beginning of the year, they go to France and they found a lovely property to buy in, in Dordogne for 250,000 euros. They put an offer on the property, they sign the compromise demand, and they calculate that at the time of uh, uh, doing that, the rate is 120, very healthy, and the property is going to cost them 208,000 pounds, well within their budget of 220,000 pounds, so they are a happy couple. However, lockdown happened, COVID started, and with the pandemic, the rate drops. And not only that, but the completion for the property, which was initially scheduled for May, is moved to the end of June. Finally, on the 22nd of June, they are forced to complete on their property. And by then, the rate had dropped to 109, which means that suddenly the property is going to cost them over £21,000 more than what they initially budgeted and well above their budget. On the other side, uh, we have Mr. and Mrs. Lucky. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lucky come to the market at the very end of the year. Um, they travel to France just before the lockdown and they found the property to buy in Brittany. Same price as Mr. and Mrs. Uh, short, 250,000 euros. But in this case, as you can see in my example, uh, their budget is slightly bigger. And that's because Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Lucky, they already know that the pound is under a lot of pressure and they are unable to get the same amount of euros as at the beginning of the year. By then, we have COVID, uh, we don't have a vaccination program, and we have the Brexit deadline coming, so the rate is 108. They agree on a purchase price and they know that that property at the time, taking into account that the rate that they have uh, by then, is going to cost them about £231,000, which is, again, uh, well within their budget. However, Mr and Mrs Lucky, as you can see in their names, are quite lucky, and uh, they see that suddenly uh, the pound is starting to gain uh, some ground against the euro. Uh, we have an agreement on Brexit by Christmas Eve, which is taken very positive in the market, and also we have a vaccination programme which was extremely successful in the UK and very supportive of the pound. Their completion is also delayed. 
However, instead of waiting for completion to happen, they decided to lock the rate of exchange at 1.16 in March. That means that Mr. and Mrs. Lucky suddenly, they not only they know exactly how much that property is going to cost them, but they also um, have a savings with regards to the initial budget, a saving of over £15,000 um, and the tranquility, as I said, of knowing how much they're going to pay. Both cases have in common that these clients didn't know exactly, or these two couples didn't know exactly what was going to happen. In the case of Mr. and Mrs. Short, obviously, they could have never foreseen that something like COVID was going to happen. And in the case of Mr. and Mrs. Lucky, they entered the market in a very difficult time for the pound with pressure for Brexit and COVID. But the difference in between the two cases is that Mr. and Mrs. Short did nothing. They just waited and then they were forced to complete at the rate of the market. Mr. and Mrs. Lucky decided to take a bit of guidance, follow the market and lock the rate of the change. And they did that at a good time. So not only, as I said, they had the certainty of what, how much they were going to pay, but they managed to maximize their budget. So what can you do to avoid a situation like Mr. and Mrs. Short? Well, I will say first thing is to plan in advance. I'm often asked by clients, how, how much in, in advance, I haven't found the property, how much time in advance do I need to have to, to actually open an account, get familiar with the rate? And I always say uh, time in this case is, 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 is key. Uh, if you have time, you can plan things. Furthermore, if you decide to open an account and do something before you actually start visiting properties, you will know better what to do with your budget and what to do in case you find the property to avoid uh, that these fluctuations are not actually affecting that price. Get a good rate of exchange. I know that sounds very basic and my guidance here will, see, will be quite clear. Don't go to your high street banks. High street banks usually... Um, don't offer very good rates of exchange uh, in comparison with a foreign exchange specialist, such as Money Corp. Sometimes there's a difference of two to three percent on the on the rate. Know your options, as you have seen in the examples I have just shown you. It's not you don't you don't you don't you don't have only one solution or one option to buy your currency. There's different ways of buying the currency. You could potentially lock the rate of exchange in advance, like Mr. and Mrs. Lucky. You have the certainty of how much you're going to pay, but also in some cases to take advantage of the rate and hopefully um, maximize your budget. You could also try to be positive or be positive and see, I think that the rate is going to go even further, which, which could be in the case of the bounded vaccination program continues being successful. So I'm going to target the higher rate uh, through a market order. So if the market goes to that high rate while I'm waiting for completion, um, I can buy and lock the rate of exchange then and there. Equally, if I'm concerned about my budget, I'm concerned that the, the pound may drop, I could put what is called a limit order and say to my dealer, please buy the currency before the pound suddenly drops beyond that level where I cannot afford to buy my property. And seek expert guidance. Um, it, this this world can be a bit overwhelming. There's a lot of circumstances that, that we don't know. We don't have a crystal ball. Um, but the solution and the planning that you're going to do will depend entirely of your circumstances, uh, your budget, your attitude to risk. And all of this is taken into consideration when planning uh, the best way to buy in your, 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 your currency. At Monicorp, we offer uh, a personal dealer to every single client that opens an account at not extra cost and that personal dealer will be the one that will take into account your circumstances and where the market is to hopefully guide you on the best way to buy your currency. And finally I'm a bit conscious about time I could be speaking about this, this, this uh, all day but I know that we want to make sure that you guys have time to, 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 to put your questions forward. And finally, just to tell you a little bit about, about Monaco, we are a global company. We serve clients worldwide from uh, America, uh, Canada, South America, Australia, um, uh, the UK. And also since Brexit, we have a Monaco Europe uh, side of it, which allows us to continue serving our European clients, but also help British clients that have decided to move permanently to Europe, continue them to the can affiliate their accounts to receive uh, and make payments in both currencies. 
So um, I'm not going to take more of your time. I'm going to pass, uh, pass, uh, pass it back to Alistair in case there's any questions for me. Great. Thank you very much, Mara. Brilliant. Uh, we've got some questions coming through thick and fast, um, which is great. Uh, so I'm going to put a couple of them to you and then we'll, we'll sweep up the rest uh, towards the end of the session. So um, some quick questions. Is there a charge for locking in a rate? There is no charge uh, per se, but however, in order to uh, lock a rate of a change, you need to have a deposit. So you normally need to have five to 10% deposit on the total amount of money that you are willing to uh, fix. Now, that's not a charge. It's, it's once the contract or the, the forward contract comes to maturity, it will be taken away from the total amount of money that you have to pay. But there has to be, there is a deposit to pay and you have to be aware of that because if you don't have this deposit, you're not going to be able to, to, to fix the rate of a change in advance. Okay. Um, somebody has said, uh, Paul has, has asked, uh, should we lock the currency in now if we have the money or should we wait until we found a property? I will wait until you find the property. Um, and obviously this is, this is not the, the only answer. Um, unless you are a person who knows that you're going to go pro buy a property and you don't mind to have this money sitting in euros, what you don't want to find yourself is because we don't know what is going to happen is the inability to maybe uh, proceed with the purchase, travel to France and have a massive delay and you have these funds sitting in euros doing nothing. So I would say as much as it's very important for you to plan in advance, um, I will normally uh, advise my clients to have a bit of a certainty that the, 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 the purchase is going ahead before you commit to actually any change rate or to, to change your funds. Okay, so there's a similar question from Brian who says, if we've got a house to sell in the UK and we go into a rental house in the UK while we look for a house in France, his question is, should we transfer our budget to euros as soon as we've sold in the UK? But presumably your advice again is... Again, it's a very similar one. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, if you see a massive change coming on the GBP euro, which we don't think is going to happen in the short term, or you are very exposed to the rate because you have a budget in mind, you could potentially uh, change it into euros and keep it into euros. At Monicorp, uh, when you open an account, by the way, you can hold different denominations. So it's like if you open a multi-currency account. So you could be potentially... Uh, changing your pounds into euros and hold them into euros until the payment in France has to be made. So it's something that is possible. So if you convince that you're going to buy and you don't mind to hold those funds in euros uh, uh, in the meantime, we can do this for you. Uh, there's a question from John, um, which um, seems like a ringer question that might have been asked by somebody from Money Corps. Are Money Corps rates always better than banks? Well, I can just say I cannot guarantee the best rate, but I can say I've been at Monaco for 13 years and we um, usually every three months we, we do some surveys through what you will call a mystery shopper. And I've never seen uh, the rates of a high street bank beating foreign exchange specialists. Uh, so I think in generally I can I can say that generally as an average of two, three percent, the rate of a foreign exchange company um, will normally be better. Than, than those of high street banks. Great, okay. Um, there's a couple of other questions, but we'll, we'll, we'll come to those at the end of the, the session. So thank you very much, Mar, for uh, sitting in the hot seat for a couple of minutes. Um, so I'm just going to, uh, there we go, perfect. Um, so uh, thank you very much, Mark. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna do a quick poll. Um, because obviously, you know, we've got hundreds of people uh, attending today. Um, it's a useful source of insight for us and for Zoe, the, the content editor, just to get a sense of what people are thinking. So I'm going to launch a poll in a second, which is a question. Um, there's, you know, uh, and then um, if you can uh, answer the, the poll and then we'll show the results back to you in a couple of seconds. So um, uh, this is the first of two polls we're going to put to you. So the first poll uh, is uh, about buying in France. What's your biggest concern? Um, when you're buying in France post Brexit, um, is it healthcare? Is it residency? Is it finding that dream property? Is it getting the right exchange rate? Uh, is it something to do with Brexit itself? Is it something COVID related, something to do with the pandemic? Uh, or is it related to mortgages and finance and seeing if you can uh, finance your property? So what's your biggest concern when buying in France after Brexit? 
Is it healthcare? Is it obtaining residency post Brexit? Is it finding the right property? Is it getting the right exchange rate, getting the most euros for your sterling or dollars? Um, is it some other Brexit related concern that you've got? Is it something COVID related uh, or is it related to financing the property? So I'm gonna give you a couple more seconds to vote. It looks like three quarters of the audience uh, have voted so far. So I'm gonna give you a couple more seconds. Uh, so uh, if you haven't already voted, now's your time. I won't, I won't embarrass myself by doing the countdown music. Um, uh, ready, three, two, one. There we go. So what's your biggest concern? Uh, a clear leader uh, in the results with 41% uh, uh, concerned about residency in France after Brexit, um, closely followed, uh, not closely actually, followed by uh, finding the right property and mortgages, roughly in the right, roughly in the right, the, the same area. Uh, then we've got something Brexit related, healthcare, uh, exchange rate, and um, COVID, uh, happily, I guess, as a, as a, as a response to this question, uh, is, is not uh, your biggest concern when looking to buy in France. Um, we won't get into a debate about how different countries are handling vaccinations. That's an entirely different subject. Um, so thank you very much, uh, everybody, for taking part in the poll. Uh, let me uh, just close that. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to hand over to our next speaker. Um, Daniel Harris from Stone King. Uh, Dan, the, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I'm just going to uh, share my screen with you. Alistair, if you can tell me whether that's that's come up. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so um, uh, ju just just I'm I'm going to I'm going to follow on from a few things that Mar was saying just now. And one of the questions that was was raised um, in in terms of uh, uh, currency brokers. Um, actually, at Stone King, we use currency brokers because we think it's in our best interests, uh, uh, sorry, in the best interest of our clients um, to use currency brokers. Um, we, we can uh, almost always get a better rate than, uh, than we can from a, from a bank. So, um, it, you know, just, just to reinforce what Mara is saying, um, it, it, it is an important, um, uh, an important consideration. So um, today, uh, I'm going to talk to you about some of the legal issues to do with, um, with conveyancing in France. But before I do that, I'm just going to introduce Stone King. So Stone King are a, uh, an incredibly well-established law firm. We've been around for 230 years. Um, at, at this point, I usually make the joke that I haven't been there that long, but, but uh, it, it, it falls on deaf ears, I think, when, uh, when you're using Zoom rather than with a face-to-face -face audience. Um, uh, so we're a national firm. We've got offices in London, Bath, Leeds, Birmingham. Cambridge, uh, and, and we have a, a satellite office in Bristol as well. Um, the team that I head is an international cross-border team. People often ask me, why do you say international and cross-border, Dan? Well, it's international because we deal with foreign jurisdictions, overseas jurisdictions. It's cross-border because the, what the, the, the big issues that arise between different jurisdictions are the conflicts of law. People sort of assume that there are, there are ways around these conflicts of law that, that that are applied automatically. And that's absolutely not the case. Um, it, it's important to take proper advice and important to understand uh, exactly what the conflicts of law are in relation to your particular circumstances uh, and how to resolve those. So we, we deal with, um, with most jurisdictions of the world, or almost every jurisdiction of the world. Uh, we, we deal in particular with multi-jurisdictional matters. So uh, if, assets if clients have assets in uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in, in uh, uh, UK, France, um, uh, US, Far East, wherever it happens to be, we, we can generally help. Uh, the sort of areas we deal with, we're, we're, we're talking about conveyancing today, um, but we also deal with, um, with, with, with planning matters in, in terms of uh, uh, succession tax and succession matters. Um, we, we deal with wills. We draft, um, uh, for example, UK and, uh, and, and French wills. Um, we also deal with probate. One thing that we don't deal with, and I mention this because I've seen a number of questions pop up, we, we, we don't deal with immigration issues. Um, so moving on, um, a few words about lockdown. Uh, well, from a legal perspective, lockdown hasn't been causing any problems uh, or, or, or delays. We're still working uh, as our, our, our notaires. 
Um, you don't need to meet us face to face, which I think is a, a, a really important thing. Everything can be done remotely. Um, so COVID uh, isn't generally an issue. I put there think identification, but even the identification requirements have been eased. Um, we're using, for example, um, uh, face recognition systems uh, de dealing with uh, uh, ID. So uh, we, we, we can actually get a picture of you on Zoom uh, or you can email in a picture and we can cross-reference that to your passport, for example. Um, this is not uh, a, a big thing. It's not a new thing for us either, which, which is quite an important point because our clients come from all over the world, quite literally anywhere in the world. Uh, and so we're used to dealing with people remotely. Uh, importantly, also, when it comes to buying a property, you don't actually need to go to France to sign all of the documentation. Um, we can arrange for a procuration, which is a power of attorney to be drafted. Um, that gets sent to us and, 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 and you sign that. Uh, which allows someone in the notarial office to sign on your behalf to your order. So you have to say, yes, that's what I want them to sign. And then they go ahead. Uh, today, the, the, the way this, this presentation is structured is it, it's based on your common questions. So first question, how do I make sure I'm 100% protected when I sign the compromis or promise to vent? Will I be taking, taking out a mortgage? Uh, sorry, I will be taking out a mortgage. What happens if I fail to get finance? Will I lose my deposit? Can I buy property with friends or family? What do you think, uh, what, what do I have to think about tax-wise if I'm buying a property? I intend to run a GT, the B2B business. I've noticed there are a few questions that have already popped up uh, in, in the presentation uh, on that particular point. Um, why do I need my notaire, uh, why, why do I need my own notaire if notaires are supposed to be impartial? I think that's a, a really important point. And finally, is it true that I may not be able to leave my French property to whomever I wish? Again, a, a really key point. Um, one of the things we find with people moving to France or buying property in France uh, or anywhere in the world for that matter, other than the UK, is when they buy property in the UK, they, they, they are very cautious. They, 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 they recognize that there are large sums of money changing hands um, and, they, and they, they protect themselves by take, getting the right advice and taking the right steps. Often when people buy property overseas, they don't do that. And it, it's not really clear why that, that, that's the case. Um, so... Um, Starting off, first of all, uh, with the preliminary contracts, um, how do I make sure I'm 100% protected when I sign the compromis de vente or price de vente? Now, there are, there are two stages in, in the French buying um, process, the same as there are in the UK, but those stages are incredibly different. Okay, the first stage is you sign a, a compromis de vente uh, or, or a promise de vente, and the second stage is you sign the actual deed, which is an act de vente. Okay. Um, uh, People, people uh, will, will often go and, and, and sign a promise to vente or, or, or a compromis de vente, de vente without actually thinking about what it's saying. And the problem is that these are contracts that can be drawn up by anyone and, and they're often drafted by estate agents. Uh, these do documents contain all the important details you'd expect, like the price, the details of exactly what you're buying, size and boundaries, bearing in mind that in France there's a 5% tolerance on boundaries, that can be quite an important point. They uh, cover the, deep, the completion dates, they cover easements and rights of way. Um, so, so easements are, are rights of way that people have over your property, which, which you know, can, can be an absolutely critical point. Um, they cover co-proprietorship details, the co-proprietorship, there is no distinction in, in, in France between uh, leasehold and freehold. You always have absolute ownership over the property. So if you own, own a, a, a flat in a block of flats, for example, um, you in, in UK terms, it's not quite the same, but in UK terms, you own a share of the freehold. Um, uh, there are conditions as well. Uh, and, and the important thing about the, these, um, uh, the, the compromise de vente, the promise de vente, these initial contracts is they're binding. Okay, they're binding. You sign it, that's it, game over. And, and this, this document can be produced to you by an estate agent the very first day you go and see a property. In the UK, when you sign, sign a document from an estate agent, it means nothing. It means absolutely nothing, and, and, and it continues to mean nothing and, until such time as, uh, uh, a, a, as you've actually exchanged contracts in the UK. In France, it's very, very, very different. Um, next question, will I be taking out a mortgage? What happens if I fail to get finance? Will I lose my 10% deposit? The answer is yes, you probably will. And, and, and the, the other point I should make is it's not necessarily a 10% deposit. There's no fixed rate in France for a deposit. They, typically, they range from 5 to 10%, but there's no fixed rate. Um, <clears throat> is it possible to insert a clause suspensive, which makes an offer conditional on getting a mortgage? Uh, it, it, is, it is possible to do that. Um, uh, and, and many, many of our clients may, may want to do that. 
but many notaries won't actually draft a promise or a compromis until a mortgage is more or less agreed anyway. Uh, just, just, just a side point, um, you don't have to get a mortgage with a French mortgage provider, you can get a mortgage with a UK mortgage provider. Uh, and, and, and if you need any details, then, then I'm sure French Entree will be able to uh, put you in touch with, uh, with, with, with mortgage providers. Um, clause, suspend, clause suspensive can be very wide ranging and they can include planning permission. Um, Importantly, your purchase cannot be conditional on selling your house. Okay, so in the UK, it's really common for people to sell their houses and say, okay, well, uh, I, I like this place in France. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to go and uh, uh, make an offer on it and, and, and we go through the procedure, but I can't buy it until I sell my house. In France, you can't do that. You have to sell your house first before you, 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 you go on, or you have to have a mortgage into the place first. Um, can I buy property with friends or family members, someone who's not a spouse uh, or, or partner? I hear that it's easy in France. What are the pitfalls? Well, yes, it, it, it is as easy in France as it is anywhere else. Um, but you need to be uh, very, very careful as you would in anywhere else as well. Um, usage is a big one that crops up. Um, pe people, uh, when they're buying property with friends, they, they often think that everyone's going to uh, uh, have, have, have the same um, uh, thinking when it comes to allowing family or friends to use the property or even friends of friends. Uh, and, and you may not be particularly happy when you discover that, um, uh, that, 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 that a, uh, uh, a remote family member has allowed uh, their friends to, to occupy the property when you want to use it. Um, payment of costs uh, is, is the other issue that tends to arise. There are property uh, uh, taxes, expenses, repairs. Uh, there, there are issues to do with cleaning and damage, of course. Uh, and those are fertile grounds for, for discord to arise between co-owners. Um, what do I have to think about tax-wise if I'm buying a property? I intend to run a JIT, uh, which is a type of B&B &B business. And I, I see we've had some questions uh, along these lines as well. Um, so you've obviously got to think about property taxes, things like tax foncier and tax d'habitation. They're, they're, they're kind of, uh, one, one is a, uh, a state council tax and the other is a local council tax. Um, and, um, uh, Effectively, those, those, those taxes apply to, uh, to all properties if you, if you own property in France. Um, then there's capital gains tax that, that it's worth bearing in mind. And one of the dangers with, um, with dealing with, the, with these sort of taxes is, is that people hear the, 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 the words capital gains tax and they think that somehow the rules are going to be applied the same in France as they are in the UK, but, but that's not right. Um, so, for example, if you want to offset costs that you've, you've, uh, you've incurred improving a property in France, against French capital gains tax, then the work must be completed by a French tradesman, the approved tradesman. Um, uh, the invoice must be in French. Um, and you're also going to pay social taxes on, on, on top of the gains, capital gains tax. And that's a really important point. So, um, uh, so with, 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 with capital gains tax uh, in France, they, they, they complete the calculation and then they use exactly the same calculation for adding on social taxes on top. And you might say, well, Dan, why don't we just call that capital gains tax anyway? And the important point here is that from a double taxation point of view, if you're, UK, if you're liable to UK um, uh, capital gains tax, then um, uh, the, 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 the taxes have to be, to, to, to quote um, the, 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 the relevant uh, law in the UK, they have to be of a, of a character similar. And the UK says that social taxes, taxes are not of a character similar to... Um, uh, to capital gains tax. So although the calculations are done in exactly the same way, you could potentially get taxed twice for, 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 for the same thing. Um, income tax is, is, is another uh, point to raise if the property is, is, is less. Uh, and people also often say to me, they say, well, Dan, look, I'm, I'm registered for tax in the UK, I'm registered for tax in France, so therefore I don't have to pay tax anywhere else. That's not the case, okay? You generally have to pay tax in both jurisdictions. Uh, and then um, you, you will hopefully be able to use a double taxation convention uh, to recover most of the tax. The one thing about double taxation conventions I've learned over the years is that you always, always, always end up the paying the higher of the two taxes. Uh, there's also, for Gites, there's a room tax uh, in, in France, which is paid uh, per bed per night to the mayor. Uh, and, and I know this point from, from um, friends uh, who, who have uh, Gites in France. Um, they, they, they say to me that often the regulations to do with, with Gites, which are, which are quite stringent, they're often applied much more rigorously to, uh, uh, to, to, to foreign nationals than they are to, for example, a, a French national who might have uh, uh, grown up in, in the village where the, the, the Gites is. 
Um, another point, why, why do I need my own notaire if notaires is supposed to be impartial? The reality is that I've never met a, a notaire who's, who's impartial. Um, uh, people, human nature is such that, that, that they will always favor one party over another. Um, your own notaire, um, if, if you apply your own, uh, appoint your own notaire, they'll be looking to do the best job for you um, and, and looking at the transaction from your perspective. So we use specialist cross-border notaires uh, and those notaries are used to dealing with UK nationals. They, they're used to um, uh, the sort of issues that arise with UK nationals. And the important point here is there's no additional cost. Okay, if there are two notaries are appointed instead of one, there's one cost that's set by the state and that, that, that cost is shared uh, equally between the notaries. Cross-border notaries inevitably are gonna offer better protection because they understand uh, what, what the cross-border issues are. And if you, if you remember going back to the points I made uh, earlier about the distinction between um, uh, international and cross-border, cross-border is the bit in the middle, the bit that people miss out, the conflict of laws, uh, and that's where real value is added. Um, cross-border notaries are used to dealing with foreign clients, they understand the legal cultural differences, they don't assume that you know the French legal process. And that's a hugely important point because you come from a culture, almost certainly, that, that, that's, um, uh, that, that has a different legal system and a different way of approaching things. Uh, culturally, it is fundamentally different in France, and, uh, and, and that's, where, um, uh, that, that, that's where all the members of this panel can, can actually add a lot of value. Um, can I leave my French property in my will? Uh, is it true that I may not be able to leave my French property to whomever I wish? And, and the short answer to that, and it is only a short answer, is yes. Um, in France, there's forced airship, and forced airship is a set of rules that, uh, that, that determines where your assets go regardless of... Um, uh, of, of what it says in your will. It overrides your will effectively. There are ways around this. The European Succession Regulation, uh, 650 2012, which we're extremely familiar with, allows you to make an election, which is a choice for the laws of your nationality to apply. It's only nationality. That's the only choice uh, you can make. Um, but elections are not always a good idea. Uh, and I'll give you one example. So um, from a tax point of view in France, uh, the, the, it, it, it's uh, from an inheritance tax point of view, um, it's not the estate that pays the tax, as in the UK, it's the individual beneficiary. And beneficiaries pay tax at different rates, depending on how close they are in terms of bloodline to the deceased. So children have the highest tax rate ounces of 100,000 euros, and they have the lowest tax rates of between 5% and 45% thereafter. Unrelated beneficiaries, which can include stepchildren and can include trusts, they only have a tax rate allowance of 1,594 euros, and they then pay tax at a fixed rate of 60%. Yes, it's a really high rate. Uh, so if you have children and stepchildren, that can cause real problems unless proper planning is applied. You also have to be aware of matrimonial property regimes, which are marriage contracts between um, uh, two parties, which can be entered into either when purchasing individual uh, uh, assets, such as a property, or they can be entered into uh, when, when you get married. The rules on those have changed fairly significantly in recent, recent years as well, with the interest in introduction of a new European matrimonial property regime. Oh, sorry, sorry, regulation, beg your pardon. Um, uh, ownership structures, the other things you need to think about. So, so uh, are you going to buy a Tonton team? Um, are you going to buy the property in, in the name of a UK company in the name of a French specialist company called Nessi? Uh, there are lots of, lots of different options. Um, and Brexit, um, uh, there are changes. Uh, there are changes to residence. Uh, residency, of course, there's... Um, uh, the, 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 the issues with succession are not so bad um, uh, be, because the UK was always treated as a, a state outside the EU for succession purposes under the European Succession, Re succession Regulation. And for tax purposes, um, there, there are some changes, but, um, uh, but not to inheritance tax, for example. That, 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 that remains unchanged. Not least of all because there's a double taxation convention between the UK and France, 1963 convention. Uh, dealing with inheritance tax. So just a reminder, Stone King can help with buying in France, estate planning in France, UK and French wills. Um, and, and finally, we, we, we have a, a free French property buyer's guide to any, any uh, attendees today who, who would like a copy. If they contact uh, French Entree uh, and ask them to pass your details to us, we will be able to send out those guides. And that brings me to the end of uh, in the presentation. So back to you, Alistair. Great. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, always fascinating. Nice to see you addressing some of the, the urban 
legends and myths of, of buying a property uh, in France. Um, there's, there's certainly one uh, one lesson, which is just because somebody says it in a Facebook group or a forum doesn't mean it's true. Uh, always important to go and get expert advice. Um, right, I've got a couple of questions for you, Dan. Um, well, more than a couple of questions, but we'll do a couple now and a couple at the end. So um, I think we, we addressed this, but just to be clear, there's a question from Owen. Uh, Owen says, can multiple names be added to the property deed, dependents' names as grown-up children and this is perhaps the more interesting part of the question is, when is the best time to do this? So, um, uh, so, so the, 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 that's actually a really complex question this, because one of the big issues that arises in France is that there is um, a gift tax, um, and you can't simply put, uh, give, 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 give your assets to, um, uh, to, to, to children. Um, so putting a property in the names of, of, of children is, is um, uh, it is a gift, and, and, and if you make a gift, you're paying gift tax. Also, to transfer the property into their names, um, there are various taxes and procedures you have to go through, notarial fees to pay, uh, all of those sort of things. So, um, uh, although it might, uh, you know, on, on the face of it, seem like a great way of um, uh, of, 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 of managing um, uh, your your uh, uh, your succession and and, and also um, uh, tax, it, it, it's not actually. It causes it causes all sorts of problems. Um, it, it's just one one thing. Um, it, it's kind of slightly related to this because because um, uh, you know gifting and passing on assets to to, to children is a very common question. Um, uh, but 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 also pe people often say, well, you know, why don't I just put it in the name of company, Dan? Or why don't I put it in the name of trust? Uh, and both of those are, are, are generally there are some circumstances where they they make sense, but it's very very rare. Uh, and sometimes the consequences can be absolutely terrible. Um, uh, from a taxation and a succession, succession point of view. So, uh, so, 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 you know, if, if you're even vaguely thinking of trust, please don't. Great. Um, just before we go on to the next question, um, Susan has commented, great bookcase, Dan. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's probably wallpaper myself, but, um, but yeah, well, well done. You, you win the award for best bookcase. Um, another quick question then. Um, somebody said they've got dual UK and Irish citizenships. Does that give them any advantage when buying a property? Um, uh, so I, I, I wish I wish I had um, EU citizenship. Uh, it, it, it's I'm, I'm very envious. Um, uh, so does it give you any advantages? Um, do you know I I, uh, I actually there are there is another procedure that you have to go through now um, if you're not part if you're not uh, from an EU member state. Um, and, and it does uh, add additional costs. Um, uh, and, and effectively, you have to appoint an agent that, that underwrites um, your, your, your tax liability. Uh, and I, I can't remember off the top of my head what, what, what the actual costs of, of, of doing that are, but I think it adds, uh, uh, you know, uh, two or three percent um, uh, to, to, to the cost of purchase. It, it's something that, that, that was not really foreseen, I, I, I think, um, uh, either by French notaires or, or in the UK, uh, until the French um, uh, revenue stepped in and said, "Sorry, you're you're, you're going to have to do this." And, and the frustrating thing about it is that it, it effectively what the agent does is they calculate the tax liability on the property, um, uh, and and, um, uh, and 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 in calculating tax liability on the property, the agent take, takes responsibility for that, even though the person who's actually supposed to do the calculation is, is a notaire. Um, Sorry, as I'm talking, I've just remembered that actually that, that has to do with sales, not purchases. But I suppose it, it still sort of answers your, your your question a little bit in the sense that uh, you know, is there anything different? Um, other than that, um, I can't off the top of my head think of anything um, di different that, uh, that that could cause any issues. Uh, but of course, when, when you have um, uh, when, when we have spouses who have different different nationalities. Um, uh, and different domiciles, and domicile is a much bigger question. Domicile is not where you live, it's not where you're born, and it's not your nationality. Okay, but where you have, have uh, people from different domiciles, um, sorry, and, and I should also mention that the, the French definition of domicile is nothing, absolutely nothing like the, uh, the common law definition of domicile. Um, but where you have different domiciles, it can cause uh, uh, additional um, complications in terms of um, uh, what taxes need to be paid in, in each jurisdiction by which parties. 
Okay, uh, great. Um, I think the answer to this is yes. I don't know why it would be no. Uh, Martin would like to know, can you act for Scottish residents buying in France? Yes. Yes. It, it, it um, is the short answer. The short um, answer. We, 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 can't, we can't pretend that we are um, uh, Scots law specialists, but um, uh, we, we, um, uh, we, we, we do understand the, the, the broad principles between um, uh, the differences between Scots law and UK law. Um, in, in particular, in, in Scots law, there is, um, there is forced airship. Uh, over, uh, curiously, in Scotland, it's over movable property rather than immovable property. Uh, in most other jurisdictions, forced airship is going to apply either to movable or immovable property. It applies to immovable property, which are buildings and land. Um, but um, uh, in Scotland, it, it, it applies to movable assets. But, um, but that's more of a planning point, I think, than, than, than a, a conveyancing point. Okay. Um, for somebody who is looking to buy in France and doesn't speak French, uh, are you and your team able to, to translate legal documents into English, or do you interpret the French and provide a, an analysis? So, so with, with our cross-border notaires, um, uh, all, all of the cross-border notaires we, we work with, we work with for a number of years. And, and, and one of the beauties of that is that um, we, we, we've, um, uh, we fine-tuned them down, down to a group of people who understand and look after our clients. The, the one thing about notaires is that they, um, uh, they don't have the same concept of client care uh, as, as we do in the UK. And I'm not saying that rudely, it's because you're not their client. You are not their client. Um, their client is the transaction, would you believe? Uh, and so they, they have no, they, they, there's no um, uh, cause for them to, um, uh, to, to offer you a good service. Um, but with us, we, we believe that the service that's offered by the notaire reflects on us. So it's, we're very clear with people who enter into partnerships that they must, um, uh, they, they must, must work uh, very closely with us. Our notaires are all English speaking um, and we have French speaking people in our office. Um, uh, and, and in fact, the, um, uh, the key contact you would have in our office is a, a gentleman called Jacques Casting, um, who is uh, uh, half French and, and half Irish. Um, uh, and, and um, uh, well, I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. He's half British, half Irish, but a French national because he, he was born, he, he grew up in France. So, um, uh, so, so he he fundamentally understands the uh, uh, the legal cultural differences in terms of translations. It is sometimes necessary uh, uh, for for French legal purposes to have um, uh, certified translations completed. Um, we obviously have all of the contacts necessary for having those done. Um, uh, but, but, but when it comes to um, uh, pr producing a, saying for example, those are produced uh, in, in English for you. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. Um, there are lots more questions, but we'll come back to you at the end if that's okay. Um, so uh, thanks very much, Dan. Uh, I'd now like to introduce uh, David uh, from Quilter International. David, uh, it's over to you. Thank you, Alistair, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you all, wherever you are. Uh, my name's Dave Denton, and I've worked for Quilter International now for 21 years uh, with advisors and clients, mostly on cross-border planning matters. So in this final session, what I'd like to do is really reflect on how one might want to invest from a French perspective. Now, this is incredibly important because when one arrives in France, as Dan has already said, things are incredibly different. We often arrive in a new country with hopes and expectations, and there's so much to look forward to. I know I, like many of you, think France is a wonderful place, but the complexities of the legal and tax systems do need some really careful attention. So the perspective for my 10 minutes presentation is really on the following, and it's what you have to spend either now in your retirement or pass on to your loved ones thereafter. It's not just your pensions, investments and savings plus or minus growth. It's all those things, but after taxation. And I remember being in Paris um, some four years ago now, and a statement was put out by Reuters that said France has just taken over the mantle from Denmark as the highest tax country within the EU. And that's of course is not a good reason not to love France to buy a property and move there but it's absolutely a reason 
why one should take some really good financial and legal advice. Um, to frame that really, just some words of a gentleman by the name of Max Baucus, um, very well intended words, a former chair of the US Senate Committee on Finance. He said that tax complexity itself is a kind of tax. And working in cross-border matters as long as I have, I fully recognize this, that complexity is not fun, but it can lead to confusion and inactivity, and often people put it to the back of the queue. And in reality, pre-planning or early planning is likely to mean you get the best possible outcomes. Dan's already indicated the rates of uh, the equivalent of inheritance tax in France can be incredibly high, and in fact, some of the highest in the world. There's a double tax treaty for inheritance tax in the UK and France, and that's pretty rare because the UK and France have very few double tax treaties. But it is as a matter of fact, if you're moving to France for the first time, there's a lot of things to take on board. So before I get into the meat of the subject, just a few words about the company that I represent. It's Quilter International, part of Quilter PLC. Um, we are now in 2021 in our 250th year. We're a central part of the London financial services scene, and we're headquartered just a few hundred meters away from St. Paul's Cathedral. Now our cross-border businesses for the EU uh, are based predominantly in Dublin, and this is Trinity College, you can see on the screen here. And we manufacture products very explicitly for a number of markets, including France. And we have to do that because although there's a belief from many people, there's tax harmonization across the EU, the four fundamental freedoms that the EU is built upon does not create tax harmonization at all, let alone within the EU um, or indeed, of course, outside of it. So any financial plan has to take into account of people's new experiences, new situations, demands, and their intentions for the future. So let's just um, reflect upon the wider piece because though we might love France today, it might not be our chosen location in the future. So as a business, we're also very proud to say that we deal in 40 countries around the world. And because of the global mobility over the period we've been in business, we actually have clients in now more than 100 locations. So let's dig straight into the subject matter itself. And I'm going to just talk a little bit about someone who might move to France and um, hope and expect that what they own from an investment perspective actually meets their requirements as a new French tax resident. And becoming French tax resident uh, can happen in a number of different ways. Um, arriving in France with the intention of remaining there can actually give you that tax residency situation. And at the same time, the rules in another country might mean you also retain your tax residency year. And therefore the importance or recognition or knowing how to use any double tax agreement so you're not taxed twice, is going to fund, be fundamentally important. So I want to give you some examples, because if you are arriving from the UK, as many people um, on the uh, webinar today will be, these are the sorts of things one might own, and I want to give you some indications at the implications of retaining those. Now, every country around the world will have intense incentivized savings scheme, which they will use to encourage people to save for themselves, largely, I think, because if you save for yourself, you're less likely to be beholden to the state upon your retirement. And the tax incentivized saving in the UK is currently called the ISA or individual savings account into which we can put up to 20,000 pounds sterling per year. And that means it's free from income tax and capital gains tax. And therefore it's a really tax efficient thing during your lifetime. If you move to France and retain that, and from a pure investment perspective, I'm not making judgment whether it's going to meet your pure investment objectives, it's not tax efficient in France. And the efficiencies afforded to it by UK's HMRC are not considered to be the same in France and it'd be fully taxable. Now, another very common investment vehicle that's used in the UK and in very many other countries around the world is a simple domestic insurance bond. Now, insurance bonds have been issued by insurance companies and banks for very many decades. And they are investment vehicles within which, in most countries, the basic rate of tax is already charged. So in the UK, for example, if you own an insurance bond and you're a basic rate taxpayer, for most people on encashment or when an income is taken, there's no further liability to tax. Should you arrive in France with a domestic insurance bond, any profit as it emerges will be taxed again with complete disregard for the fact that it's been taxed internally once. And that's because although double tax treaties have a good intention, they don't always work in the way that one might imagine or hope. 
Now, over a number of years, as we've all got a lot more IT savvy and we've grown our investment portfolios, we've had a tendency for all the right reasons to place them on investment or trading platforms. And from an expediency and ease of use point of view, of course, that's highly attractive. And also when people move from country to country, including into France, there can be a belief that any efficiencies from that platform in the UK may prevail in France. And as a matter of fact, um, these can be counterproductive because when there is any income or dividend from equities or coupon from fixed interest or rent from property-based investments held on a trading platform, even though that trading platform is a third party platform on which you place your wealth, as those incomes or gains and profit emerge, even if not taken out to the client's personal account, they become reportable very quickly, normally by the 15th day of the next month um, after that income or gain has emerged. So these things can be quite complicated for people to manage or to consider. Pensions are also hugely important. Most of us have saved up throughout our lifetime with tax identified schemes called pensions. And how that's going to be disinvested in France um, is very important. There are choices to be made, perhaps before you arrive in France, and choices to be made when you're in France. And according to where you're coming from and what sort of pension you have will indicate what is the best way to take that money from that scheme. And for me, these are the very best reasons why advice is fundamentally important to any conversation. So what I want to move on to now is really offer a suggestion that for investors as French tax residents, there are certain vehicles that are used very extensively. And that's because the rules that pertain to them are generous according to the French tax code. And you might be familiar that there are some very simple bank type accounts known as livres that are used commonly in France. Very rarely can one have more than 23,000 euros in there. They have a minimum rate of return because they're deposits. So they might be for short term savings or monies you want to hold simply on cash. But from an investment perspective, from your medium and long term perspective, the vehicle of choice for many French people and offered by all French banks and insurers are called assurance V, which of course literally translates as life assurance. Now, very importantly, life assurance bonds as investments are issued through many countries around the world. But unless the vehicle has been built specifically for the French market, it's unlikely to give you the full suite of benefits, which we'll see in the next slide go way beyond pure investment. Now, what I mean by that is that in the 110 metre hurdle race, there are 10 hurdles that we need to cross to get the finishing line. And a life assurance investment bond issued through another country, unless purposely built for the needs of the French tax system, is unlikely to give you the full suite of benefits. So we operate from Dublin. Uh, it allows us to very effectively market our proposition to a number of countries within the EU. And we specifically build a proposition, an assurance V for the French marketplace. And the assurance V offers a suite of benefits that I'd like to describe very briefly now. And the first one is that international assurance V, as opposed to domestic variants offered by banks and insurers, offer a very wide range of investment choice. So we as a provider of the product want to give the investor and their advisor the ability to invest within the product as far afield as appropriate for their needs and balance in terms of risk and rewards they're trying to seek. So we can access stocks and shares on only over 20 stock markets around the world with very many hundreds of mutual funds from very well-known managers. So you can get that portfolio just right for your ongoing needs. But beyond that, it's the tax efficiency that really counts. And I think what's very important here is that offshore assurance v contracts in locations such as Dublin don't deduct tax at source. So profits that remain within inside the structure, which is assurance v, can stay there and not be taxed. And that's because the individual applicant or the owner, a resident of France, owns the insurance policy, but not the underlying assets that it's linked to. And although it's called life assurance, the life assurance component is a mere 1%. And it's not purchased for the benefit of the 1% life assurance cover. It's purchased because of the rules that fit around the policy in terms of the suite of benefits we can see on the slide here. 
So not only does assurance offer you the ability, if it's an international product, to roll up on a gross basis without any tax deferred until benefit is taken from the policy. After eight years of holding on premiums up to 150,000 euros, you get a reduction in the income tax liability that applies after that point in time. As well as a reduction in the income tax liability that applies after eight years, each owner also gets a 4,600 euros allowance for which profit isn't subject to income tax. And that therefore encourages people to invest sooner in their journey so that they more quickly get to that point where the actual tax liability is thinned down by that extra tax allowance of 4,600 euros and the reduced rate of income tax, which goes down by some 5.3%. It's also fair to point out that despite our best intentions, what we want to do in the immediate future might not be the same for the rest of our lives. And though we've built our assurance v specifically for the French market to cross all 10 of hurdles that I mentioned earlier, we like to make our products as portable as possible. So for example, if you may go back to the UK or intend to go there eventually, and let's face it, the future isn't certain for any of us, then the product that is our assurance V can be made very suitable with retrospect for the UK marketplace. And there are other countries where that's the same as well. And I noticed in the attendance, there are people from as far as the of Australia. And that's another good example where an assurance V contract built the way that we would undertake would be incredibly efficient not just for someone who is in France today, but for countries around the world, including the UK and Australia. Now, Dan talked about succession rights, which I think is incredibly important. And if you come from a common law country, so those countries such as the UK, Australia and the US, you have expectations of what you can do with your wealth during your lifetime and upon your death. So we have an expression legally that's called testamentary freedom. And testamentary freedom is what you have in the UK, but you don't have in France or most European countries, which are civil law countries. And that's because they have forced airship and the law of the land dictates who will inherit when you pass away. If you're from the UK, you have testamentary freedom that allows you to choose who will inherit. Unfortunately, when you move to France, even as inverted commas a Brit, you're subject to the French rules. However, an owner of Assurance V, as well as having the aforementioned benefits, gets to choose entirely who would inherit their wealth when they pass away. A fundamental advantage of this investment structure is that you can choose in your lifetime and nominate who will inherit, which effectively can disregard the forced airship rules in France. And this can dovetail incredibly well with well-written wills, which they themselves can help you choose who will benefit. But the additional benefit if you use Assurance V in combination with a well-written will is that not only can you ensure the right people benefit at the right time, but you can also obviate the need for probate, which can be the slow, uh, long-winded, drawn-out process of allowing your wealth to be passed on to your loved ones, which naturally most people would want to do as quickly as possible when they pass away. Number five, we have succession. Succession tax or inheritance tax. And once again, Dan mentioned this is really penal in France. And one of the benefits inherent of Assurance V is that upon passing of that wealth from Assurance V to a beneficiary, there's a wider range of beneficiaries that receive a tax-free allowance from an Assurance V than any other form of investment. And not only a wider range of beneficiaries can receive that allowance, the allowance is larger in size as well. So to cut a, a long story very short, generally speaking, if you're leaving wealth to your children, then the maximum allowance that's tax-free in most instances in France is going to be 100,000 euros. Through Assurance V, it can be 152,500 euros, and that allowance can be used to a wider range of people and not just your children. And then finally, to sweep up, we all want simplicity as we grow older. And the complexity we see living and uh, undertaking a great life in a new country that we've wanted for so many years can be daunting. Assurance V allows you a simplified process whereby the life assurance company who's the host can be appointed to make the declarations and reporting as withdrawals and income is taken from the product. And given for income takers who want something every month of the year, that can mean 12 separate reports, the ability to ask the life company can do that for you 
can be wholly appropriate to simplify one's life. Now, ladies and gents, I've covered an awful lot of ground there, and I appreciate the, the devil is in the detail, but I'm gonna finish with a quote that I really like. And once again, it's from another American gentleman. It's a gentleman called Will Rogers, a very famous raconteur from uh, several decades ago. He famously said that the only difference between death and taxes is that death doesn't get worse every time Congress meets. And of course, for me, Congress meeting is the next budget. Um, I watch out for budgets in every country to do business. And with intrepidation, I think to myself, what will happen next? And I've absolutely no doubt that the really significant COVID-induced debt that we see around the world will make countries and governments even more concerned about how they raise revenues to plug the public sector deficits. And on that basis, I think that places a higher obligation on all of us and our advisors to a better job to fully understand what is appropriate and available and will fit an individual circumstance in the new country that they've moved to. So at that point, ladies and gentlemen, um, I will pause for breath and hand back over to Alistair should be the, any questions. Great, thank you, Dave, that's excellent. Um, so we've got a couple of questions. Um, let me put a couple of them to you now. Uh, one question is, do I have to be French resident to take advantage of assurance v and and that's, if i don't and if i don't then can i move some of my investments to it now that's such a good question and um unfortunately i'm not aware of an assurance v that can be purchased um, outside of france you can buy products that are like assurance v and will have some of the benefits but they won't have necessarily all the benefits so it might be possible you can utilize something that's very similar in the country that you're currently in. And if it conveys the majority of the benefit that you want, that might be appropriate. Okay. Um, Charles would like to know, um, it might be a tricky one to answer, but what's the typical cost of obtaining Assurance V? Um, there are two components to the cost of Assurance V, um, although this will doff, differ with every provider. And one of the components will be the life companies charge, the provider, such as Quilter International. And our ongoing charge per year um, is going to typically go between 30 and 50 bips for the provision of the product. Now that will vary according to the premium and the investment, and also sometimes the complexity of the underlying assets. And then beyond that, there's going to be a cost of the advice, because as I think I've already indicated, uh, this isn't a pure investment tool, this is a financial planning tool. And taking advantage of one with advice is really highly recommended. And we as a business, because we recognize the complexity of this, only allow our products to be used through a financial advisor. Okay, great. Uh, and one last question now, and then we'll come back to you at the end. Um, can uh, husbands and spouses have joint assurance V, or do individuals have to have a policy each? Oh, that's such a good question. And, and I'm sure Dan will have a few words to say about this. Um, there's lots of things you can do, but just because you can do them doesn't mean say it's good or desirable. If you come from the UK, the matrimonial regime here, then you have no choice. In France, there are a number of matrimonial regimes that can make joint policies complicated. And also it's very important that the person who invests, it is their money. And the reason for that is if uh, one person to a marriage owns that wealth, but the policy is jointly owned, that implies a gift of half that wealth between parties. Now, in the UK, lifetime gifts between married couples does not facilitate any gift implication. But in France, there's not freedom to transfer right between parties in many situations without it being a gift and there being a taxable implication. So the short answer is it is possible, but the long answer is you should probably only do it with advice to show it's safe for you. Okay, great. Any, any follow up on that, Dan? Um, it, it's, um, I, I mean, matrimonial property regimes are, you know, it, it's one of the fundamental cultural differences between, you know, the, the UK and other jurisdictions, although it, here's the irony, it, it, is that matrimonial property regimes are, are very, very common um, uh, across the globe. Uh, so 49 of the 50 US states practice matrimonial property regimes. And eff effectively, there are two different types of matrimonial property regime, uh, or two broad categories. There are lots and lots and lots of different types. But um, there, there's one matrimonial property regime um, 
uh, in France, it's séparation de biens, where, which is the same as the UK, basically, where each party owns their own assets separately. Uh, uh, and, and if they die, they get divorced, they, they, those assets are, um, uh, r remain in their own pot. Um, then there is um, uh, Communité Universelle, which is um, uh, Universal Community of Property, um, which is equivalent really to the UK joint tenancy, where, where both parties own all of the assets, um, uh, effectively 100% of the assets. So when one of them dies or gets divorced, they, they, well, one of them dies, the, the survivor owns 100% of the assets. Um, but, but the kind of variety that, that, that then appears are things like um, uh, community of acquisitions. So in a community of acquisitions, um, uh, both parties have, have their own assets. Um, uh, and, and if they receive anything, uh, any inheritance from their own family, that goes into their own pot. Um, uh, and, and, um, uh, and, and, and um, uh, but, but if they, um, uh, if they, if they get divorced or, um, uh, or if they die, then everything they've acquired together during the, the, the uh, matrimonial uh, periods will be treated as jointly held assets. There are lots and lots of different types. Sounds like we could do an entire webinar just on that, by the sounds of it. Um, I think we could. So let's, let's, let's pencil that in. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dan and uh, David. David, thanks very much for your, your presentation. Um, before we get on to uh, the bit we've all been waiting for, which is the, the Fast and Furious round, where we try and crack through as many questions as we can. I'm conscious of time. It's quarter past 11. We said that we'd run this until half uh, half 11. Uh, we've got one more poll uh, to put to you to uh, make sure you're still with us. Um, so I'm just going to launch this now. So same principle as before, I'm going to put a question to you uh, and then uh, would like you to uh, answer, uh, choose one of the options. Uh, so here it is now. So this is really a question about um, intention, you know, what your time frame is for buying in France, uh, which is always very interesting for, for us from a content perspective. So when are you looking to buy in France? Is it within the next three months? Is it between three and six months? Is it between six and a year? Uh, or are you looking further out uh, uh, over, over a year? So when you're looking to buy under three months, three to six, six to 12, or 12 months or more. Uh, so we'll just give it a few more seconds there. I think we're up to uh, uh, three quarters of you have voted, which is great. So we're gonna close it in three, two, one. Okay, so uh, looks like the majority by a, by a, by a whisker uh, is uh, six to 12 months, which if you, look th if you look at that through the lens of when will we think we will be able to uh, legally travel and safely travel and be able to move around in the country that we want to go to, that seems logical to me that, that six to 12 months uh, is, uh, is the winner there, followed by just over a year, uh, and then a, a smaller percentage of people looking to come over uh, within the next, uh, or looking to buy within the next uh, three to six months. So thank you very much to everybody for taking part. That's really interesting. Uh, so we are going to move into our, our quick fire round now. So um, if, Everybody, I think David and Dan, you're unmuted. Mar, if you can unmute, and then uh, that way we don't have to faff around with muting and unmuting. So I'm going to put some questions to you, um, and then feel free to to jump in. You know, if you think that actually there's another another point that you want to make uh, based on one of the answers that the panelists has given them, then feel free to to jump in. Um, so uh, let me just. Uh, it's the problem when you're you're using multiple screens, right? Here we go. So. Um, Mar's been waiting very patiently since she spoke at the beginning for some questions. So let's wake Mar back up with some questions. So do I need to open a French bank account to begin the currency exchange process? You don't need to open a French bank account. In fact, I think it's one of the things that uh, clients are very anxious when they're looking to buy properties like, oh, I want to open a French bank account. Well, you don't need to open a bank account until um, you complete on the property and you, you start living there, really. Uh, uh, I don't believe I, I don't believe and maybe Dan can help me with that that uh, unless you have a French mortgage in which case you maybe ask 
to us to have a French bank account. I think that um, these days it's not even compulsory to do that, which creates all the problems for French lenders. You don't need to have a, a French bank account. It could be useful just like in this country to have a bank account where you can pay utilities and, and you can manage your payments, uh, but it's not compulsory. Again, um, with a trading facility from Monicorp or from other foreign exchange provider that has the dual authorization from Europe and the UK, you will be allowed to keep balances in, in euros and in pounds, receive payments in both currencies and manage payments effectively if you need so. Great. Uh, Dan? Um, yeah, if I, if I can. Um, uh, so um, uh, I, I agree, I don't think it, it, it's compulsory, but it, it actually facilitates things, it makes things a lot easier. The sooner you can get a French bank account open, the the the, the better, really, because uh, uh, you you can then take pay your 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 um your, your local taxes and whatnot much much more easily uh, through through the local bank account. Um, uh, the, the 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 one thing I will add is that um, the, the French banking system is is, is perhaps um, uh, two or three decades behind um, the, the the rest of the world. So if you want to open a, a French bank account, you've usually got to turn up at a, a French uh, um, office. They'll print off, um, literally, I, I'm, and I, I'm, I'm not exaggerating here, literally 50 pieces of paper for you to sign an initial. Um, uh, it, 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 it's really the, the most extraordinary thing. And, and, and um, there's a lot less flexibility um, with, with French banks than there is with UK banks. Uh, and the other point that I think is really worth it, uh, mentioning is, is that um, if you go and draw on a UK bank account by a, a couple of pounds because it's a holiday home bank account, you, you know, that's a really big deal in France. That's a really significant deal. Um, if you write a check that, that, that doesn't clear, that is, is, a, is a major, major problem. So uh, you, you do need to um, uh, you, you do need to, to, to really bear that in mind that there's always going to be enough uh, money in the account. I'm sure Alistair has contacts. There, there are um, there, there is a bank that offers specialist services to UK nationals, and I, uh, you know, my my view is that it's actually a really good idea to use them be because they will offer you know that interface against again between uh, the expectations of UK clients and and and, and the French clients. No, that, that's right. And, and just a very quick point on on banking habits. Banking habits in in France are obviously very different, necessary to to banking habits in the UK. And when we're talking to uh, individuals looking uh, at mortgages, for example, one of the things that comes up quite often is that if people are living in their overdraft and have stacks of credit cards in the UK or in other countries, because that's just how you do it, um, that's you know, they take quite a dim view of that in France when lenders will forensically go through your bank account. So uh, when it comes to mortgages, it's, uh, it's definitely worth leaving a window of time to tidy up uh, the house before you uh, present to a French bank, um, because living in your overdraft is just not something that happens in France. Um, uh, Mar, there's been a few questions about asking you, put, putting you on the spot for rates, which is probably a, a bit harsh. And uh, but maybe, maybe if we can take a macro view and say, you know, using a crystal ball, what? How do you think the rates are going to do uh, with uh, the sterling against the euro over the next few months? Well, I will say I don't have a crystal ball. I wish I had it, uh, but uh, probably I've never seen in the years I've been um, in foreign exchange the market such such an in un uh, such an uncertainty as we have right now. I will say, however, that um, for those who have been pounds, uh, the pound is holding quite strong uh, against the euro. And in the short term, unless something unexpected is happening, uh, that is the view. Um, today, we have the Bank of England, for instance, probably taking a position on, on interest rates uh, that could that could go one way or the other, supporting uh, probably the pound. If there is a, a hint that they are going to keep the interest rates that, as they are, or maybe even raise interest rates. There is an optimism, I don't know if you notice, in the air with the UK, with the vaccination. But obviously, I think that what last year uh, taught us is that suddenly there could be a new strain of COVID, or we could have more bad news on the AstraZeneca uh, uh, um, vaccination, and then suddenly the pound is, is dropping again. Also, for those who are exposed to the euro in general, in Europe, they are facing their own demons with COVID, uh, with, with a very late vaccination, with problems now in Italy again, with another lockdown. So things are not looking 
that that well for Europe, and that's going to be pre putting pressure on on the currency. I think that if things go well for the UK, we should we should see the UK or the, the GBP against the euro going to levels of 117. And just to put it in perspective for those who um, who are new in the market, uh, last year um, this is the best rate we have had in in nearly a year. Uh, we saw last May slightly and very timidly touching 115, but mainly the pound has been under a lot of pressure. So I will say it's an excellent moment to exchange euros and uh, anything could happen. So if you're worried about budget or uncertainty, maybe it's a good time to take to take some steps. I just want to very quickly, because I know people in America, those who are holding US dollar is a completely different story. Probably the graph that I have shown is the other way around. For, for America, the US dollar was very strong um, just because moments of crisis and recession and international crisis, usually a safe haven currency as the US dollar uh, gained a lot of value and that's what we saw last year. Having come coming now uh, to, to another moment in which there is more risk appetite and everybody's more, more optimism, um, the dollar has, has, has weakened and again is expecting to weaken even further if things, as I say, go as, uh, as they're going right now, uh, just because the, the US dollar has been very, very uh, overvalued last year and also because they are, they are again facing their own recovery. So if you have US dollars again and buying into euros, even if the US dollar is a bit stronger than the euro, it's, it's also worth it to, to just keep an eye on that and make sure that you're not losing more value on your currency. Great, that's, that's brilliant. Um, really good question from somebody who's asking what, it, they want to keep on top of what the exchange rate is, but they're asking which rate do they monitor? Is it the published data, if they're looking at the BBC business site, or is it the tourist exchange rate? What, what, what would you advise for somebody who's trying to, to keep a handle on what the rates are? I think the, the, the rate that you see on websites, on the Financial Times, on Bloomberg, on Google, is what we call the interbank rate. Uh, so the interbank rate is not the rate that you're going to get when you exchange your funds. However, I would say it's a good indicative if you are just following in general how the market is going. You just need to be aware that when it comes to make your transfer, you're going to get what is called a commercial rate. And a commercial rate is a rate without a margin. So we take a margin from that interbank rate, which is the profit that the institution is doing, either Monicorp or High Street Bank, and you're gonna end up with a commercial rate. On the bottom of this is the touristic, the tourist rate or the travel rate, probably is the worst rate that you can get is where the margins are, are wider. So I will say it goes like that, the interbank rate, which is the one you see in the BBC, in Google, in the Financial Times, and it's a good reference. And then the commercial rate is the one that come, come probably closer to that interbank rate and the one that uh, normally you will exchange your funds via uh, transfer. Okay, great. Um Thanks, Mark. So very quickly, I'm conscious of time. Uh, are you guys happy to hang on for another 10, 15 minutes while we crack through some more questions? You're happy to do that? Brilliant. Absolutely. Um, obviously, you know, if, you, if you're watching this and you do have to shoot off, don't forget that we are recording this and this will come out to you. Uh, so uh, so don't, don't panic. Um, so Dan, a uh, couple of quick questions for you. Um, one around your notaires point. So if someone says, um, why are French estate, why do French estate agents, or some, let me qualify that, why do some French estate agents guide you to use their notaire or only one notaire, uh, which is obviously different to the advice that you gave earlier on? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm smiling because I, I, I answered that one um, uh, on, on, on the Q&A uh, button. And, and what, I, what I said in that one is that um, uh, if I answer that question, I'd get into trouble. Um, so, um, so, so let, let me see if I can, let me see if I can um, give right, try and try and dance around it. Yeah, I will. I will. So um, uh, estate agents have um, uh, very close relationships with, um, with, with notaires um, and um, uh, many, many of them they, they've worked with for many, many years. Uh, and uh, so uh, for them, it, it, it's an easy way of dealing with things. Um, the notaires that they've worked with on a regular basis um, are unlikely to rock the boat, okay? Um, the, the issue uh, is really that um, uh, if you're using an independent notaire, then that independent notaire is going to have a clean sheet. They're gonna be looking at, at, at things uh, without, uh, 
the, the issues being colored by the relationship between the notarian and the estate agent. Um, uh, and so if there are issues arising, so for example, if there, if there are easements on the property, someone's going to write away over your property, then, um, uh, they're, they're, then rather than the notaire just so, simply saying to the estate agent, well, look, you know, there's a bit of a problem, uh, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, and, and the estate agent going to you and saying, well, it's not really a problem. You know, it, it happens all the time in France. And, and yeah, our, our independent notaire will say, look, you know, black and white, this is the issue. Um, uh, there, there, there are also, you know, we, we, we've, we've experienced um, on, on many occasions situations where, um, uh, particularly in, in, in rural areas where, where a notaire uh, has, has been in the area for very many years, we're, we're working with the estate agent. Um, and, um, uh, and, 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 and again, uh, you know, the relationship will be a bit too close and a bit too cozy for you to get independent advice. Uh, and, and that's the key point. That's the key point is, is that we think that if, if, you're, if you're using an independent notaire, the advice you get is going to be absolutely clean. There, 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 there is, uh, and, and it's going to be in your best interests. Great. Thank you. Very, very deftly answered. Um, uh, question for you, uh, Dave. Um, do, oh, is, is, the, is the assurance fee expensive in terms of entry, exit, and management fees compared to other investment types? Uh, financial products in France, I do tend to think are a little bit more expensive than the financial products in the UK. But I would also say that as a financial product, it's much more than an investment. And some of the benefits it convert, confers are, are really very significant. Uh, you now, the mere fact that in France, it's the primary vehicle that is used by French people I think would suggest to me that it very much is a central and important part that is, is, is of good value. Okay, great. Um, and there's a question. Uh, can, can I, can, sorry, yeah, can yeah, I yeah. just add, add, add something on it? Uh, sure, um, I, I'm neither authorized nor regulated to provide financial <laughs> advice. That, 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 that's definitely something that, that that's, uh, uh, that David's really made. But um, uh, what, one, one of the key points, and David mentioned this in his presentation, what, one of the key points about assurance fee is that if you're trying to mitigate uh, uh, French inheritance tax, then, then it's actually a hugely important um, uh, tool for, for, for being able to do that. So, um, uh, you know, we, we, as I say, we can't provide advice. We can, we can tell people generic advice, which, which is what I've just done, but, um, uh, but, but we can't provide detailed advice. Uh, it, 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 it's if you're in a situation where, um, uh, where, where, where the assurance fee uh, is going to work in a cross-border context as well, which is exactly the sort of advice that, that David will be able to provide, because it won't always work in cross-border context, but um, you know, if, if you're in a position where that will work, then, then it, it's, it's a, a really, really, really important tool. Great, thank you. Um, there's, there's quite a few questions, uh, Dan, around specifically around inheritance and leaving questions to children. Um, and I think actually because there are so many of them and because they're quite, each one of them is quite tailored to the person who's asking the question. Um, I've just been chatting to Zoe, who's the digital editor. And what we think we might do is pull together a separate piece of content that will we'll work with you on that and we'll address those questions and we'll come back out to uh, the attendees of, uh, of the webinar because we, we wouldn't be able to get through uh, them all uh, right now. So we'll, um, for those of you who've, who, for those of you who have asked a question about, you know, how do I leave my property? What happens if I do X, Y, and Z? Um, we will, uh, we will look through those questions and we'll come up with a, a specific piece of, uh, of content either on our website. Um, and we're also looking at uh, pulling some content into our next French, French on Train magazine just to cover off so many of the sort of the key questions that have been asked uh, throughout today's session. I, I think um, it's a, a, a really important point because with, 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 with estate planning, and, and you touched on it by saying how many different variations there are, um, there, there are, when, when, when it comes to cross-border matters, um, there are a huge amount of moving parts and those moving parts all interrelate with each other. Now, now if you're purely looking at the French system or purely looking at the UK system, um, uh, there, there are fairly clear answers and, 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 um, uh, and, and, and the... Um, uh, laws and uh, tax laws and succession laws have been um, fine-tuned over many years, so that so that there are clear answers. Um, uh, with with, with cross-border matters, there generally aren't um, uh, obvious clear answers because what you do in one jurisdiction 
can have an adverse impact on what happens in the other jurisdiction. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, it, it, it's a key point that, 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 that you really need to look at it holistically. And it, it's sometimes not that helpful answering just one particular point, because actually in answering that point, it raises half a dozen others. Yeah, no, that's that's perfect. So I think we'll we'll kind of acknowledge the questions uh, now, uh, and then we'll work out a way of coming back to those individuals and, and maybe you know have a, a much broader piece, uh, which will hopefully answer most of the questions. Um, uh, Alistair, quick... if I can just add yeah. one comment to that, you know, this distribution and use of Assurance V in France, um, our products are largely distributed by advisors in France who are expatriates themselves. So they tend to have a good insight in terms of that cross-border imperative that Dan refers to. And, and I couldn't agree more. Inheritance tax in the UK is a fiendishly complicated tax. There are 93 reliefs and exemptions. And the Office of Tax Simplification says it's right up there in terms of complexity. If you look at the French system, it's so not what you would expect if you move there from a common law jurisdiction. So getting advice from someone who is there but understands the country that you've come from is really vital. Great. That's perfect. Um, so I'm going to ask one uh, last question to, to all of you. Um, uh, we, we haven't inevitably haven't been able to get through uh, lots of the questions, but we will do our best to, to go through those and, and uh, create content around those questions and come back to you. And if there are specific questions that people have asked, we will come back to you individually. And don't forget, of course, um, if you want to adopt a, a belt and braces approach, you can always email webinar at frenchentree.com uh, with your question uh, and we'll also pick that up. Um, one last question uh, to the three panelists before we wrap up. Uh, what's the most significant change post Brexit for holiday home buyers or sellers in France? What, what do we think is the, the, the most significant change after Brexit? And I'll start with uh, David. Gosh, that's, that's a tricky one. Um, I think there's such a raft of things that um, could catch people out and we refer more to people who will live in France in the long term they're buying a property in anticipation um, of moving there so I think really it's a, a longer term financial planning aspect um, and I can't be specific there's a myriad of things to take on board Great. Uh, Ma? Well, from a currency point of view, there's nothing I can say. Uh, I think uh, just by my experience and speaking to, to other companies I work with and, and myself being a Spanish and, and traveling there and having a holiday home in Spain, I will say that they put, uh, especially if you buy a property for a holiday, will put a lot of pressure on you. Um, when it comes to lending, um, the lenders I speak with uh, are already having a lot of restrictions about offering products to people that is buying only for holiday. Um, and also, we have to bear in mind that the status of people traveling to France and being able to stay in France and how long you can be in France will change with uh, has changed already with Brexit and is already happening when you when you when you move um, in the border, you know, they're, they're asking you how long you're going to be staying for. They monitor these. So I think it's going to have it's going to have an impact on the freedom that um, especially British have of buying uh, holiday homes and how flexible they could be with that arrangement. So um, hopefully it's in the benefit, I think, of both countries, the same with Spain, to make sure that both countries work together to make this as easy as possible because it's in the interest of both countries. But I think it's going to be challenging. Yeah. OK, great. And uh, Dan? So, um Looking at um, succession, so that, that, that's who gets what when you die. Um, th there was a lot of concern uh, on, on the run-up to, to, to Brexit from, um, uh, from clients who were saying, well, look, Dan, I, I, I don't want to take any advice on, on, on this because it'll all change after Brexit. And actually, it hasn't. Um, and, and the reason it hasn't is because the UK opted out of the European succession regulation, which means that it has always been treated as a state outside the EU. So the advice is exactly the same from a succession point of view. As for inheritance taxation, there's a double taxation convention, as I mentioned earlier, 1963 double taxation convention that, 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 that deals with um, uh, tax between the two jurisdictions, and there haven't been any fundamental changes in, in, in inheritance taxation. Um, the, the, the big thing that has changed 
um, uh, that, that many people have picked up on is, uh, are, are the residency requirements and the fact that we no longer benefit um, as a state outside the EU, we no longer benefit from the free movement of, uh, uh, of people across Europe. So, um, you know, that, that's been the biggest loss, um, I, I, I think, as a result of Brexit. Uh, and, and it'll be a loss that we continue to, uh, to feel pretty much indefinitely, I should imagine. And, and I think just on that residency point, I mean, I think it would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the fact that, you know, that did come out in that first poll as the, the area that people are most concerned about. Um, and there, there have been a number of questions about, about residency. And, and obviously at the moment, you know, we're still in a state of flux. We haven't bedded everything in yet. Um, it's difficult to get somebody onto a webinar who's going to definitively and concretely answer questions about residency. Um, but, you know, as we, as we go through the year, uh, as, we, uh, as we develop, we'll, we'll try and nail down some of those answers to those questions uh, and potentially in the future have a webinar just about residency. Um, so please, if you've asked a question about residency uh, or, you, or you ticked residency in the poll uh, question, don't, don't think we're ignoring that. Um, it, it's simply a question of wanting to make sure that the information that we share with you is, is current and accurate uh, rather than just uh, conjecture. Um, so, uh, Thank you very much everybody to wrap up um, again if we didn't get to your question uh, we'll be coming back out with some content feel free to email webinar at frenchentree.com um, if you've enjoyed the session today if you found it valuable uh, feel free to drop us a message in the chat box as you uh, as we wrap up um, it'd be you know, really really useful to know if you found it useful interesting um, again if there are topics other than residency that you think that we should be talking about as the leading resource um, on uh, on buying and living in France drop us an email webinar at frenchentree.com. Um, I would like to say you'll remember I, I mentioned earlier about our, our lovely magazines, which are available uh, on subscription uh, and uh, uh, ordinarily you'd be able to pick them up in news agents because they're all closed. Um, Total France and French Entree. I'm gonna drop into the uh, chat box now um, uh, a, a special offer that we've got for everybody attending the, the webinar, uh, which is 20% uh, off uh, all of our magazine subscriptions, um, including uh, French Entree, which comes out next month. Um, so there's a code there for you to use, which is Webinar March 20. The code is Webinar March 20. Um, and uh, the URL is francemedia.shop. Uh, so bear with me a second while I just pop this into the chat box. Uh, there we go. So that should be in there now. So 20% discount on all of our magazines. Uh, so you can um, have a, a slice of France come through your door, uh, particularly for those of you who are uh, not looking to buy for six to 12 months. It's always nice to be continued to be uh, inspired for uh, uh, keeping, keeping the dream alive. Um, thanks to everybody who's attended, uh, whether you're watching live or on the recording. Um, we hope that we've been able to answer at least some of your questions and, and uh, offer you some value uh, over the last hour. Um, thank you particularly to our panel today, um, Ma, Dan and Dave. Uh, thank you for giving up your time. Thank you for going a little bit over to try and answer a few more questions. Um, and as I say, inquiries that, and questions that come into that email address, um, if they're specific to your part of the forest, we'll, we'll pass on to you uh, and you can go back to the, the readers um, and answer those questions. So. Thank you very much everybody for attending. Uh, we'll see you on the next session uh, and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks very much. Goodbye.